then where have you been? Do you live in a cave? I don't know. But my name is uh, Tony Harmer. Uh, and right now for me, it's uh, fairly early. In fact, it's uh, 1.33 actually. My on-screen drawn clock that I just made is three minutes slow. Uh, so it's the middle of the night time. Uh, for me. I live uh, just outside Cambridge in the UK and to give me my full uh, title I am Lord Anthony Harmer. Actually I'm a Lord, that's not a joke, but you can see how seriously uh, I take that particular uh, thing. I never ever use it apart from when I'm checking in in any American airport um, because it's a very handy thing to have. You're actually a Lord, yes I am, I'm going to bump you to first, willing, great. So that's that. Uh, I am better known, however, as uh, the Design Ninja uh, on YouTube. I'm an ex-Adobe person. I'm a designer. I'm, I'm all sorts of things. I'm a lunatic. I'm a troublemaker and all of that stuff. So that's me uh, thoroughly introduced. I think, uh, would you agree with most of that, Melissa? I think that's, that's pretty much accurate, I think. Myra, yes, my panel, Barb, everyone else nodding. This is very good. Uh, so that's handy to know. Yes, so I thought what we'd do is we'd do some things with some creative cloud magic uh, and a bit of an ICMYI, uh, no, ICYMI uh, thing. So an in case you missed it thing for some features. Uh, so we'd look at uh, a little bit of magic in, in, in InDesign because there is only a little bit of magic in InDesign. I mean, you can make your own magic in InDesign, but magic, 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 magic. There's only a little bit of that, so we'll do that. Uh, we'll do some magic in Illustrator in just a little bit, and we'll do some magic stuff in Photoshop. How does that sound? Very good. I'm glad you all agree. Okay, so let me just get out of this thing here in Illustrator, because that's what I was doing that in. And I think we'll go ahead and use uh, InDesign first. So there's a couple of places where uh, there is magic. And by magic, I mean a little bit of assistance from Adobe Sensei. Uh, and the first one is Content Aware Fit. If you've missed this, then you really are missing a trick. Okay, so what I'll show you what that is. Here I have a frame which is waiting for some content. Here I have an image. Okay, now just before I deploy this properly, I'm going to show you the image just there. Okay, so you can see what the full image is like. Okay, and I'm going to drag that and drop it into this frame. And you can see that InDesign naturally just goes to the extent of the boundary, shortest edge uh, here because it's landscape meeting uh, that content. But if I use this small button here, content aware fit, Okay, then Sensei analyzes that and fits it to that frame, which saves you a whole stack of time because otherwise you're clicking on the content grabber or donut, if you will, uh, just there, okay, in the middle. And then you're moving things around, you're zooming in, you're zooming out, all of that stuff. And it will change depending on the frame. So for example, if I went ahead and changed the nature of this frame and then asked it to analyze it again, it's going to give me a different fit for that as well. So it really is uh, quite clever and it's just a click away. Yeah, so you set the frame up the way you want it, click content aware fit. So in the grid of fitting options, in the options bar here or control strip, you just click on that thing, hovering over it will tell you it's content aware fit. Okay, and that's perhaps uh, InDesign's bestest uh, piece of magic there. Uh, it does have a couple of other things that are assisted by Creative Cloud Libraries. So if I right click, for example, uh, on the image here inside of the frame and right click on that, you can see that I have an option here to find similar images. Okay, and it will then move over to the library and you can see that that is just starting now. Uh, and finding me a list of my next 12 wives uh, straight away, which is very handy, useful stuff just there. So at least 12, I would have thought. Uh, no, just 12, right? So <laughs> you can see it's analyzing that based on content and color. And that is a pretty handy thing to have, especially if you're, uh, if you're working on a publication or some something and people want uh, a similar thing 
okay, to that, but not exactly the same. Saves you a lot of searching, saves you going out to a browser and dragging a copy of the image into it as well, which is exactly the same thing. Uh, essentially what's going on, it's just more convenient in that particular space. Now, the other thing that exists inside of InDesign uh, is the ability to search for similar fonts, which is actually in a lot of other things now as well. So they all have uh, that capability. I'm just gonna move this bar out of the way. You can't see it at the moment, but it's right in my way just there. So I'm gonna move it down here, there we go. Uh, you can't see it, so you won't know where down here actually is, but trust me, it's at the bottom of the screen, there you are. Right, so here you can search for similar things. It will search for similar fonts uh, to what I have there, but, there are a couple of other little nice little nuggets in here which do meet my uh, definition of magic. So I'm going to change this to something like Minion just for a moment. Okay, so I'll change that like so. And I think I actually managed to delete the text there. So that's always winning. Now I'll change it to Minion. Doo -doo. There we go. So, and it's all too big. So we'll bring that down in size. So we can all see it. Okay, so when you're working with uh, open type, you do have a couple of nice little options down here. You can see this small open type menu, okay, at the bottom. And what you can do is you can click on that and it will tell you if there are any open type variations available for you. Okay, so if there are stylistic sets in the font that you're using, yeah, it will list the stylistic sets. And I'll try and find one for you in a minute. But this one here is saying uh, you could use an all small caps. So it even gives you a little preview, okay, of what that looks like. And just a click and you've applied that, okay, from that set. Now, if I take this uh, to uh, Trajan, which should be there, this will definitely have uh, some stylistic sets. I can't bear that hyphenation even when I'm doing pretenders. Right, there we are. So if I select this, this should have a few. You can see that, okay? So now I've got this list of a few different things and the stylistic sets in, in Trajan, okay, have, uh, you can see color variations here. So by default, it's uh, gold, okay, AKA yellow. But here I can click for silver or copper or both. Yeah, okay, like so, terra rosa, steel blue, and ochre. So I can go through all of those different stylistic sets. And I think that is kind of magic, because you don't have to go searching through the open type menu, okay, to find those options. So hopefully, some of the other products that support stylistic sets, well, Illustrator and Photoshop, uh, will take on board that kind of thing in the future. So that would be really nice. But in terms of magic-y stuff, that's all InDesign has to offer for us. But let's face it, InDesign is the workhorse that brings everything together, really. It doesn't get too much magic, sexy stuff. And not too many people want magic, sexy stuff uh, in InDesign. They just want it to work properly and not crash repeatedly. Who knows? <laughs> or, you know, or redraw, or all of that stuff. So there you are. That's the stuff in InDesign. Of course, the thing that gets all of the magic, really, very, very early uh, is Photoshop. And I thought, could I do some magic tricks in Photoshop? And of course I can. So magicians typically uh, make people disappear. Side note and amusing story, uh, at dinner this evening, as I said, it was uh, my lower middle, I've got four daughters, so we have a, an upper and a lower middle. Uh, my lower middle's daughter's birthday is today. So we were out at dinner with her last night. And they said, what is it you're doing tonight in the middle of the night when you should be sleeping? I said, oh, I'm doing something, a Creative Cloud magic show of some lovely people in Denver. And they said, right, OK. And um, Sharon said, I suppose this is where you're going to ask me if I'm going to come and sit in with you wearing a spangly bathing suit, right? And I said, no, don't be ridiculous. That's terribly sexist. Yeah. And, but can I borrow it? And now we're not speaking. So, you know, <laughs> that's how it goes. <laughs> anyway, right. So I'm going to do a magic trick, make the woman disappear. This isn't going to be too difficult. And another side note, take a good look at this image. What is it? It's a woman with a recorder. Yeah. I don't know what you call that in the United States, but here it's the instrument of torture given to school children 
to get them to play some sort of instrument. Okay, it's just like a wooden tube with holes in it that makes a fairly hollow sound. Uh, but anyway, she's got a recorder and she's got a hat, but she appears to be superimposed on a sheet of asbestos. <laughs> Don't quite know what that's about, but there it is. On a sheet of asbestos makes complete sense to somebody, just probably not us. Anyway, so let's make her disappear just so we can have the nice asbestos back. So I'll go ahead and use the select subject algorithm just here. So it will analyze the image, work out what the subject is. I am giving it a fairly easy target, however, uh, although it is actually pretty good at selecting subjects. Now, one of the things with this, if I just tap Q here to go into quick mask mode, you can see that selection is pretty tight. Yeah, it's very, very close to the edges. In fact, it's so close to the edges that it only leaves a hairline of pixels all around it. So if I were to just hit delete and use content aware fill at this particular point, then there will be a hairline of pixels. If I zoom in for you, you might just about be able to detect that. So you can see there is this hairline here. So whenever I use this, if I intend to do content aware fill, which I do, I then go back to the select menu and expand that selection just by a small number of pixels. Okay, it helps because it just gets you over that edge. It also gives content aware fill a little bit more room to work. Okay, so it doesn't have to work too hard around that. So here I'm going for 12, perhaps a little bit excessive, six would have probably been uh, just fine, but 12 is good, so I'll do that. Now I've expanded it. I can go ahead and delete this because it's on a background. It will then ask me what I want to do here. So content aware is just fine. And I'll hit okay. And there you go, gone. So that's my first magic trick, made someone disappear. Was gonna do soaring in half, thought that was probably inappropriate, changed my mind, just disappearing is good. So that's that one for making things disappear. Then I've got this image here in which I think that this woman on the left probably wants to make her boyfriend here disappear, right? Because her posture is saying, why isn't he going away? His posture is actually saying, I think I found something else that interests me. So I'm gonna to go to the line tool and indicate where I think his gaze is going, just over here. And just to make that clearer, I think I'll go ahead and change the stroke because in case you miss this, okay, there are new new options for the stroke or relatively new options uh, for the stroke and you can work with it inside of the properties panel. So I'm just gonna dial that up a little bit to maybe like seven or eight pixels, something like that. Okay, and change it to a dotted line. Interesting that there's actually nothing showing up just there. That's kind of embarrassing. Should be showing me a stroke. Weird. Photoshop, you're ruining my gags, man. But anyway, right, there we are. I'll just show you. I think his line's going over there to the woman in the athletic gear working in the background. Oh. So I think we'll all agree that he can go. So we'll help her out. So what we'll do there is we'll get the object selection tool. Okay, and we'll change that to lasso, just here or lasso. How do you say that word? Lasso. Is it lasso or lasso? lasso. 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 I was I was raised with people saying it's a lasso and I thought it's only got one O. Anyway, there you go. I'm going to go with that now. Right. So I'm just going to go around uh, the uh, soon to be removed boyfriend uh, just there like so. You can see the object selection tool has done a very, very good job yeah, of actually going around that edge. But again, it's slightly too good. So I'm going to use my method from before. I'm going to expand that. I'll expand it by the same amount there like so. And then I want to remove him from the picture. So for that, I'm going to go to the edit menu and I'm going to go to the content aware fill workspace. Okay, so a separate workspace uh, appears here and you're going to find going forward that Photoshop is gonna do this more often 
Yeah, for a long, long time, things that have been processor intensive have been sidelined into another application. So if you think of things like uh, liquify uh, and vanishing point and those things, they're actually a sub and, and even bl the blur gallery, they're actually separate applications that suspend Photoshop's allocation of memory, okay, and then move and get their own allocation of memory and work freely with the machine. You, you don't need to know how a car works in order to drive one, but I do think it's sometimes handy to know some of that stuff, right? So it's suspending its activities while it focuses on this and, and allows more processor time to this. So on the right hand side here, I have a preview of the result uh, that we're going to get. I can zoom in uh, on that if I need to do so, okay, like so. And it's just a tiny bit ghosty on this side. And what I can do on the left hand side is remove things and filter down, okay, what the content aware fill algorithm will use to replace it. So I don't need it to use any of that tree, nor do I need it really to use any of this stuff here. And you can see that the overlay I have here is green because my masks are set to green. Okay, but otherwise you'll get potentially a different color. Uh, I don't need any of the soon to be single woman's um, uh, body in there either. It's not gonna use that. And you'll notice that every time I do this, it's actually updating on the right hand side. So it's changing. The ghosting that I had there has now gone. Now there is an element of shadow here, however, right? That I might want to keep. Yeah, so I could actually brush that back in just in that place there, but I'm gonna try removing it and see what happens there. And I think that's actually a better heel. So now if we go ahead and hit okay for that, you can see a boyfriend has gone. He's actually, been matched out onto another layer or the heel has been matched out onto another layer. That's an option you have inside of that workspace. Okay, so you're doing this non-destructively. The original content is there, but you've just got a healing layer on top. And there she is. She's being thoughtful just for a moment, but her day is about to improve. Okay, oh. because what we can do now, yeah, now she's much, much happier. Sorry, we can ask a question. Oh, sorry, I thought I heard someone starting to ask a question. Right, so now that now that she's back in being single, her day's gonna brighten up because we're gonna to go to the select menu, or sorry, the edit menu, and we're gonna come down to the sky replacement edit just here. So if we launch that, the image gets analyzed. Now, this is a hazy background, uh -oh. yeah, but look at that in one go. Now that is a little bit of magic because it's preserving almost all of the details there and a few other things are happening. First of all, it's adding in a sky. It's actually using the last sky uh, that I used here. But like I said, her day is getting lots better. Now there's a bunch of different defaults in here. Okay, so blue skies, spectacular and sunsets. You can add your own. So if you habitually photograph skies and keep them and have nice skies, you can add your own folder of skies to this actual tool. Okay, but we'll go for blue skies just here. Now I've got a plain blue sky. Watch the buildings as I change these, by the way. Okay, because you won't just see the sky change. Okay, just watch the buildings carefully. So I'm going to go for something that's slightly more overcast, just a few more clouds in it. Okay, but you'll notice that the tones of the building change ever so subtly. Now to drive that home uh, with something more contrast, if I go ahead here and choose maybe uh, a sunset, can you see that everything gets warm all of a sudden? Okay, and if I come down to sunsets, sorry, they were spectacular. If I go to sunsets here and choose one of these, you see again, that color changes. So there's a bunch of different options in here. If the edge that you're getting doesn't meet your needs, okay, you can shift the edge, you can use a positive value to expand it and a negative value to reduce it. Okay, you can fade the edge, okay, you kind of like feathering the edge down and you should see that happening. If you look in this area here, it's very, very clear uh, just there. 
you can adjust the effectively the background image, the brightness here, making it brighter or darker as desired. And you can change the temperature, warming it up, okay, or cooling it down using that slider there. You can also change the scale of the background if you want to do that. And if the light direction hasn't correctly been interpreted by the tool, you can always flip that around. So if you're thinking you know, it's not a convincing uh, light source for that sky, you can just flip it like so. And then you can change the lighting mode, the amount of adjustment and the amount of color adjustment and also how it's output. Okay, so I'm going to have this output to new layers because I want you to see the level of analysis. Oh, and by the way, you do have some tools in here to refine that selection. So there's a there was an edge just here on a building that wasn't being captured properly. And you can always use this tool and actually brush in where you want uh, that to reappear. So you can just go ahead and select that tool and then just paint that in or out like so. And as usual, the option key is your friend if you want to reverse the operation there. So I'll go ahead then and hit OK. And here's what you actually get. Let me just collapse the properties panel for a moment. You get a new sky replacement group. OK, and in that you have uh, a different brightness contrast adjustment and a color balance adjustment just there for this particular one. You then have the mask that's generated for the objects, OK, that it sees to work around. You also have this depth mask here. Okay, as well. So you have this really nice fade that goes across and then you have a curves adjustment there as well, which does everything to the stuff underneath. You can see that the top two are clipped to the sky and to the depth adjustment here and the, uh, sorry, the depth map there and the curves are just going everything down onto that image. So it's changing everything for you. Now that actually is magic, I think. Who's not seen that before? I'm, I've been interested in it. I've read about it and I, I hadn't seen it. So I was pleased to see that. I, I had a question as well, though. Oh, yeah. Would you would you at this point take the boyfriend healing layer down underneath all of that stuff? Could it's do. Absolutely. Used. Yeah. So so it's being okay. worked in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <clears throat> all right. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I was interested to see that. So yeah. I was happy to see it. Yeah. I mean, you can move the stack however, however you want to move it. So, yeah. But yeah, you would do that at that point. I just left so there was enough room in there for that to uh, to go ahead and work. Now, if you don't want to replace the sky, so if I get rid of the sky replacement group, we'll turn that off, okay? But you just wanna use it as a selection tool, you can, because sometimes you get things that are surrounded by a sky or something that even looks sky-like, yeah? So in the select uh, menu, in the automatic section, OK, down here, you can see there is sky. Now, at the moment, it's greyed out because I don't have the background selected or anything with a sky on it. But if I choose that now, you'll see that's another automatic selection or intelligent selection that it makes for you. You can see how it works there like so. So it's very, very cool uh, that it does that. Very cool. It's one of my favourite things, the sky doing it anyway. Oh no, the boyfriend's back. We need to sort him out, right? So moving on, right? So we'll get rid uh, of those two. I thought I'd do another magic trick for you um, while we're here, okay? I thought we'd make something move because we should make things move in Photoshop as well. So I thought it'd be kind of cute uh, to make something here. So I'm gonna go for a 1080 by 1080 uh, image at 300 ppi not that that's desperately relevant but i'm just giving you all the details uh, and then i'm going to get my gradient tool i made a gradient earlier with a dark red okay and uh, a light red in it who knows how to switch between the different gradient types using the keyboard let's see who knows i'm the dead 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 chuffed if this is new information for myra melissa barb jane and ari Colin, be dead chuffed. You don't know. I do not know. I know how to switch the um, foreground and background the old way and option drag them across. Um, okay, it's was... the bracket keys. Well, you we have a bracket now that you can do it, but in the old days you had to, um, you know, option drag them across and then they would switch. But no, I don't know how to change them with the shortcut. Yeah, left bracket. So if you use the left bracket, you'll cycle to the left. 
Oh. Use the right bracket, you'll cycle to the right. Cool. And it just makes you look so much, I mean, you know, functionally, it's kind of handy because you don't have to do the whole mouse transaction thing to go up to the top of the screen to click on it. But it also makes you look oh so slick if you're working in front of people. It, it makes you look oh so slick. <laughs> That's awesome. That's because I am. I'm, I'm so slick. It's magic. <laughs> it is magic. <laughs> anyway, right. Now I've got that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just draw my gradient like so. Uh, then I need another asset. So I am going to go to my Creative Cloud libraries. I don't want them there, so I'm going to move them out here. And look, I even made a little library just for you, Denver UG. In a year, I'll look at it and go, what is Denver? -ug? <laughs> Moving on. Right, so I'm going to go ahead and bring in uh, this top hat, like so. I could use my object selection tool to grab hold of that or select subject. It's a nice, easy one uh, for it to select. Uh, just a quick tip on sizing content here. Lots of people like to, this one's really easy, right? Because it's a small image, yeah. But lots of people grab the handles to do all of that stuff and resize it. And if they've got a super massive image, they do command or control on Windows zero. So you can see the edge of the thing. Do you do that? Yeah, you do like command zero or control zero. So you see the whole thing. I tend not to, I tend, because they normally land if you place them right in the middle of the document like so. I have my grid on here, my little grid of nine for the reference point. Mine's set to the center. I've got width and height constrained and I use my favorite tool ever. Let me just see if my screen zooming is coming across on Zoom. Can you see that? Is it zooming? No, that's a shame. No, it's not. Uh, okay. Right, so my favorite thing in Photoshop is stapler accident finger, yeah? If you've never seen stapler accident finger, well, you probably have, but you don't know it's called stapler accident finger. If I go and hover over the W of width, you will just about see stapler accident finger, right? Also sometimes called tiny weightlifter finger, yeah? Because it looks like it got tiny finger dumbbells on it. So it can do like, ooh, I'm making my phalanges so strong, right? Like that. So, uh, but stapler accident finger is very useful because stapler accident finger gives you an indication that if you click and drag, yeah, or tap and drag in the locations or the directions that are suggested, you'll have an effect on the associated field. That sounds super BBC2 wordy, right? So just to clarify, the W there is associated with the width field, okay? If I hover over the W and then press and drag down, you can see how quickly yeah, I can change the size of that much quicker yeah, than I can do by going and dragging corners around to do it. And there's loads of places where you can use stapler accident finger in its different variations. Just for another quick aside, in some adjustments like hue saturation, if I clicked for hue saturation, you can see that there's a special version of stapler accident finger just there. Okay. And that one, okay, will allow you to do things such as change the amount of saturation. And you can see there that it's working like that. If you hold down the command key and do it, then it changes the hue. Can you see that slider moving along? It's having no effect on the image whatsoever because it's a black hat, right? But you get the idea that you can do that. And so there you are, that's stapler accident finger. And stapler accident finger is present in four panels. So keep an eye out for stapler accident finger just there. Good. Right, I'll get rid of that adjustment layer because uh, I don't want it. There we are. So got my hat, going to select it. Uh, so select subject just there. It will return me a selection of the hat and then I'm going to mask that off. Now let's just zoom in just here and have a look. Again, there's a little bit of fringing around the sides of that. So I'm focused on the mask. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to go to the filter menu and I'm going to come down to the other menu, 
and I'm going to choose minimum. OK, and what this will do. OK, it will reduce in the selection. OK, now at the moment it's doing it by 1.7 pixels. If I bring that out and in fact, if I just go and click in maybe. Well, anywhere here, really. Can you see where I am just in the middle of the lip of the hat there? And you can see that part here represented. Now, if I start to increase that, I'm going to go way, way, way too far. Can you see how it's reducing? Yeah, like so. So all you need to do generally with minimum is bring it in. You can even bring it in at a sub pixel level. By that, it means it's less than an integer, less than a whole pixel. Right? And the default here is 0 0.2. But one pixel is normally more than enough yeah, to fix most tiny fringing areas. Uh, it can also work on in two ways, right? Preserving roundness so it will look more for curves and preserve those or squareness, yeah? And your subject will be the only thing that will inform you on which one if you're using it, you know, the right way. So just watch the selection, okay? And see which one works for you. Some things such as this hat, which is full of curves, very few straight edges, yeah? Squareness isn't gonna do a whole lot for it, okay? But that is improving that selection. Just so you know, if you need to go the other way, if you need to expand outwards, if it's too tight, then in the same menu, okay, you have stylize, uh, sorry, other uh, maximum, just there, and maximum will do the opposite. So just focus on the mask, yeah, and then use that and it will expand the selection outwards as well. So minimum and maximum, pretty straightforward uh, things there, good. So now I've got that uh, hat just there like so, I'm going to actually duplicate uh, that layer uh, using the shortcut Command J, uh, which is an homage to a British television show called EastEnders. Are you familiar with that television show? It's set in the East End of London where they all talk like that. They talk like that in the East End of London, all know that's a proper common, isn't it? Yeah, and it's Command J because if you were to spell duplicate and you were from the East End of London, you'd duplicate it. Yeah. So that's the Photoshop team proving that they actually watch a dreadful British soap opera. Yeah. About the East End of London. It's a true fact, honestly. Another true fact is that the illustrator engineers are paid by the UI element. So that's, you can have a look at that and there's plenty of evidence for that. Right, moving on. So I've got the hat here like so, uh, but what I only want, I only want part of this hat. Ooh, why do you only want part of this hat, Tony? Well, I'll tell you. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the first hat. Let me turn this one off. I just need one. Uh, sorry, no, it is the top one I want to work with. I'll turn the other one off just for a moment and I'm gonna focus on the mask. And then I'm gonna to go to the pen tool. Who uses the pen tool? That should be pretty much all of you, right? And do you like doing that stuff? Oh, it's a pussycat. Do you like doing that stuff where you um, click and drag the handles and all of that stuff? Do you like doing that where you drag things out? No, nobody does really. Do you like having to have coping strategies for working with the pen tool? You know, such as having the ability to switch to the direct selection tool so you can just fix your stuff and all of that. Do you like those things? Nobody does if we're really honest, yeah? Okay, so the best thing I think since sliced bread really uh, is the curvature pen tool, which is present in both Photoshop and in Illustrator. And I'd like to show it to you in Illustrator first. So I'm just gonna dip across to Illustrator just for a minute, okay? And we'll move past that loon just there. And what I'm going to do is very quickly, okay, create a quick grid just here. So I'm just gonna draw a shape. Okay, then I'm gonna carve that up into a grid like so. And I'll have, uh, let's have, hmm, I'll have three rows and three columns. So I'm just gonna do three uh, 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 and three like so. And for some reason it decides to give me a gutter when I do that, even though I didn't ask for it. It just says, no, you can have a gutter. I don't want one. No, you can have one anyway. All right, so now I've got those things. 
That's really good. I should have just divided it in twos really, but not to worry. Uh, and then Command-5 or Control-5 to turn those to grid lines. All good with that? Yes? Perfecto. Right, actually, I am going to add uh, some lines in the middle. So I'm just going to add a couple of lines here, just using my line tool. In fact, I'll add one. Rotate tool, hit return, 90. Hold down the Alt or Option key, hit return to create a copy. That's a handy shortcut to know. Rather than clicking copy, it's another thing that makes you look super slick. Hold down Alt or Option, boof, return. I'm done. What are you doing with all the clicking stuff? Right, now you've got that going on. Okay, we'll just uh, turn those into guides as well. And then I'm gonna get the regular pen tool, okay? So, uh, not that one, uh, just a pen tool here like that. And I'm gonna draw a circle, okay? Because we all know drawing straight lines with a pen tool, very, very easy. So I'm going to go to the top of this square just here, okay? And I am going to click and drag 56.775% into the next sector. Okay, now I've been doing it a long time, so it's very easy for me to achieve that made up number. Okay, like so. I'm then going to move down to this point here in the middle and go to the same approximate uh, made up number. Okay, and then come along here and click like that. And then come along here and click like that. And I'm drawn perhaps the worst circle I've ever done. That's because I didn't really achieve the 56.775 uh, that was actually after. So what would I have to do? I'd have to tap A on my keyboard and then I'd have to go and adjust all of these handles like this. I'd have to click on the point to make it active. Do all of those handles and go, oh dear, I'm so sorry I didn't go to 56.775 because I, I carved up my square wrong. You'd have to do all that stuff, right? And if you were drawing a line uh, like a bouncy line, you'd have to have even more coping strategy because what you'd have to do is you would have to uh, click and drag upwards. Okay, in fact, let me just get rid of all of this stuff just for a minute. Let me just remove all of the bits I've got there just to make it easier for you to see what I do. Okay, so you'd have to click and drag upwards. Yeah, then you'd have to come across a bit and then you'd have to click and drag downwards, but now you want to create another curve. So you'd have to hold down the alter option key and swing that handle around to the same place. And then you'd have to go over this way and click and drag downwards, then hold down Alt or Option and swing that around. And if you've not put the point in the right place, it's back to direct selection tool time. And you'd have to do that. Does that all make sense? You're familiar with that uh, kind of thing? Completely pointless. Yeah, it's just a waste of time. You had to do it back in the day, right? Uh, you had to go down into the cold, dark earth and fetch back coal to be warm, but that doesn't mean we should all do it, right? Just because you can doesn't mean you should, yeah? Okay, there's plenty of other options for staying warm. Right, good. So the curvature pen tool, very different, okay? Because the curvature pen tool wants to draw curves. Top tip, it's how it got its name, okay? So once more, I'm going to draw a rectangle. This time I'm gonna cut it up properly, okay? Like so, so I'm gonna carve it into just two and two uh, here. I don't know why I got all full of hubris and all that stuff and decided to just go ahead and, and make it three before. I thought I was being clever and it failed. Right, there we are. So now curvature pen tool. In Illustrator, it has a shortcut. In Photoshop, it does not. Okay, so in Illustrator, it's shift back tick or tilde, yeah. OK, so it's the one to the left of the Z key on your keyboard, typically should be, I think. Anyway, here we go. Right. So it's got a slightly different icon. It's got a little star next to it because it won. OK, and what I'm going to do now is just simply click at the top. This is me clicking. I've clicked. Now I'll come down to the right hand side here. OK, and I'm going to click just there. And you might be chuckling away to yourself at the moment thinking, ha ha, he's got it wrong. It's drawing straight lines just like before. But as soon as I move down to the bottom, yeah, you can suddenly see that it's actually doing me a massive favor. Okay, and I can just come up to the top and complete it and I've drawn a circle. Okay, now, if I needed to move any of those points, yeah, I don't need to resort to the direct selection tool. I just grab a point and move it and the path will conform, okay, to wherever it's moved to. 
if I want to add a point, I simply go to where I want to add a point and click. That's exactly the same as the regular pen tool. Okay, and I move that around. If I want to delete a point, all I need to do is click on a point to make it active, hit delete, and it's gone. Okay. If I want to change a point between a corner and a curve, I don't need to come across to the properties panel or up to the, op the uh, options bar or control strip at the top, or go and get the convert point tool or hold down any other keys. Okay. All I need to do is double click on it and that changes it. If I double click on a neighboring point, you'll see now that I've got straight points just there. Okay, really simple to draw. And if I wanted to go ahead and do that whole bouncy curve thing, all I'd need to do there, okay, would be to click, click, double click, click, double click, click, double click, click, double click. You can see how easy that is. Now, some people start breathing into brown paper bags at this point and say, but I need my anchor points. Don't take away my anchor points. I need them. Yeah, well, that's good news for you, because if you want them, they're still there. All you're doing is drawing them in a more frictionless way. Um, Sarah, you're awesome with words. Your homework is to find me another word to use instead of frictionless without me going and getting my thesaurus because it sounds like marketing speak. So what you can do is drop that in the chat a bit later on and I'll use that word from now on. Good, right, moving on. <laughs> okay. Right, so you can see there that the curvature pen tool is groovy and it exists here in Photoshop. So if I tap P for my pen tool, okay, and if I just go and long press on that for a moment, you can see Photoshop has all of the pen tools all of the time, yeah. OK, the pen tool itself and the freeform pen tool, you can toggle between those by holding down shift and tapping P. Yeah. The curvature pen tool, you have to actually select it, but it works in the same way. So if I just click through here a little bit like so, you can see exactly the same. Right. So it's nice and easy to use. Right. I'll just undo that. So all I want to do here is cut away the back of the hat. So I'm just going to go and just look at the maximum and minimum of the curves and work my way around. And do you know what, even if I go wrong, and this is me going wrong on purpose, all I need to do is just go back to the point and steer it into place. Yeah, and I can just keep on doing that. And then when I'm ready to resume drawing, okay, it just carries on from that point. So I'm gonna go around here and just complete uh, what I was doing there. Okay, again, if I needed to just reconform that path, you can see how it's all connected. OK, it will stay together. Very, very easy way to draw. So if you haven't used that yet, OK, do have a go with working with that. I'm then going to right click on that and I am going to turn that into a selection. So make selection. Uh, feather radius of zero is just fine. I don't want it feathered. I want it to be nice and sharp. So I'll hit OK. Now I've got a selection. I'm going to go to the mask just here and do I want it on that one or do I want it on the other one? Just thinking for a minute. Actually, I'm gonna to go to this one just here and then I'm gonna hide that just there. Okay, so I'm gonna fill this uh, just there. So to hide the back, the target layer is hidden. That's true. Thank you, Photoshop. So Alt Backspace to do that. So if I turn off the layer above, you can see this is what we've got on that layer. Okay, and then We've got a layer sat behind. I'm sure I've got the stacking order for that wrong. I definitely have 100%. So I'll just switch those two around like so. There we go, that's better. Good, because what we need now, of course, uh, is a rabbit. You can't do a magic show without having a rabbit coming out of a hat, right? So I found one, I found a rabbit. Fun fact, there's actually a rabbit just outside the door here it's our rabbit Daisy and she's mahoosive and scares builders when they come round because she's the size of a dog. <laughs> but anyway, we did have a bigger one, but unfortunately he died. So I'm going to go ahead and get this bunny just here and edit. We can all have an, oh, look at the bunny. So there you go, see, it works every time. <laughs> oh, it's the cute bunny. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and select the subject just here. Now there's some areas at which the algorithm uh, 
or the logic in the algorithm is not entirely certain. So there's some areas up here where it goes, I'm not sure if that's still a continuation of the ear. So I'm going to hedge my bets and I'm going to include that. Now, another top tip is you can actually use the object selection tool to remove stuff, okay, as well as add it and select things. So two modes, rectangle or lasso, uh, just there. See, I said it properly this time. And what I'm going to do, let me just zoom in a bit here and move and just tap Q for a minute. You can see the areas here that I want to get rid of. Okay. So I'm just going to come along now. I'm going to hold down the option key. You can tell when you're subtracting because a small minus appears in the cursor. Okay. I'm just going to drag around that and it's still not sure just there. In fact, it's holding on to it. So I'll get rid of that another way. Let's try around the ear just there. Nope, too much. So I'll undo that. Okay. We'll resolve that a slightly different way in a minute. In fact, I'm going to get the regular lasso, lasso now and hold down the option key and just drag around that to remove it. And then it's time to go into the select and mask workspace. Uh, Alt Command R, Alt Control R, oh, sorry, Option Command R, Alt Control R on Windows. So go to that. Another task-based small app inside of Photoshop uh, just here. So. What I think would be most useful, you can see it's also got rid of that extra little bit at the top, even when it analyzed it deeper here, it went, no, sorry, mate, that's definitely not to, not ear roll just there. Uh, it's set to object aware, so it's analyzing the object. You can also go for color aware. So if you think color is a better fit for you, you can use that, but object aware is working pretty well. I'm gonna give that a bit more radius to work in, okay? And make that radius smart, which will turn on another part uh, of the algorithm just there. And then I'm gonna use my refine edge brush, which you get to by tapping R. And I'm gonna brush down here and see what it returns me. That's not bad. And I'm just gonna go around the edge here, around those whiskers and that soft fluffy stuff just there. That's not too bad. And then I'll just go down this side and see what it yields for me there. That's pretty good. That's not too bad. The thing is what I'm doing is I'm clearly indicating what isn't rabbit. So it's gonna work out, okay, what is rabbit and then it's gonna try and resolve that for me. Now it only glitched just at the top of the ear there. So I'm just gonna hold down the option key and back up over that just to reduce that and get it to rein it in uh, just a little bit. I think that's working pretty well. So what I wanted to output to here is a selection because I'm just gonna copy it and drop it into somewhere else. So we'll go okay and do that. So I've got that and I'm gonna copy that. Then we'll go back into my other image here and just in between these layers, go ahead and paste that big bunny. Yeah, so I need to resize it. So Command T, Control T, I'm gonna set my reference point here to the top left and then just use stapler accident finger. It's kind of funny. It's like an animation, right? Because it's kind of, it's kind of it was just appearing like, <laughs> just there like so oh dear i'm not well right moving on <laughs> now i'll bring the bunny into play look at the bunny yeah the bunny right so this time i will manually resize just from that corner there i need it to be just slightly larger so when the bunny is in the hat because I want it to be in the hat and come out of the hat like that, it's going to poke out of the bottom, right? So we can fix that. I'll apply the transformation now because that's that's pretty good. And I like the way it's just like staring at us off the top of the hat at the moment. It's very nice judging all of us and especially me, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a layer mask to this layer. I'm then going to get my rectangular marquee tool and I'm going to create a generous marquee like so, focused on the layer mask here. Black is my foreground color, so option delete or option backspace to fill that. I can then deselect because now when I move the bunny downwards, it's masked off. But both things are moving. Can you see that? That's not working terribly well right now. So all I need to do is to unlink the mask from the pixels using that small icon at the back there, right? So now they're unlinked, the mask will stay exactly where it's put. So if I now move the bunny, well, I'm moving the mask actually. If I now move the bunny, 
you can see it goes down. It's just a little bit exposed at the bottom there, but not to worry about that. So I think this would make a nice GIF. So we'll go ahead and do that, I think. We'll go and hide the bunny, right? And then we'll reintroduce it. I am gonna just go ahead with that mask there and just move that down a tad, just so it hides the bottom. And just check that that's working, good. Right, so let's make a GIF. So window menu, timeline. I am mindful of the time. I will get into Illustrator in a moment. I'm gonna do uh, create a frame animation, click on that and it creates me my first frame, like so in the timeline panel, just here. All right, and then I'm going to go ahead and add a new frame. I can't do a lot about the UI, unfortunately, to, um, to change the size of it. I should, however, be able to change the relationship between it and the document. It's just not giving me a hovery cursor. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and add a new frame. I'll go back to the first frame and I'm gonna hide the bunny, like so. Okay, so the first frame, no bunny, go to the second frame and then we'll introduce, whoops a daisy, we'll introduce the bunny uh, from there. So we'll drag that or move it up with the keyboard, safer. Now the whiskers are appearing out of the side, but I'm not desperately worried about that. There we go. So there's my first frame. There's my second frame. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another frame and I'm going to hide the bunny again, like so. It's got the whole thing fitting. All with me so far? Having fun? Good. Excellent. Right. What I'm going to do now then is I'm going to select frame one. I'm gonna hold down shift and select frame two. I'm then going to come across to an icon down at the bottom here. It's next to the new frame icon for tweening. Okay, I'm gonna click on that and say, how many frames do you want me to add here? So it's tweening that selection. Okay, and I'm gonna say, add me 24 frames. You better add some seconds, point seconds. I do this all the time, add your time in. I just, I just tell it to do, do the frames, it works okay. Really? It's gonna go like yeah. that. You don't do like a point point one, point no. two? No. Okay, I'll be quiet. No, 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 it's cool. You're talking about the timing, yeah, on the on yeah, the frames yeah. at the bottom. Yeah, no, I've got all these set to zero at the moment. So I literally Because want you're them doing to go... 24 frames. I don't frames, usually do yeah. that many frames. I do like five. So I do like point one, point two seconds. I want smooth. I want smooth. I mean I could do less. Actually, yeah, let's do less. It'll be more, it'll be, no, Bob's saying no. So now I've got to do 24, so unlucky. Right. <laughs> there you go, so let's- I'm crash my computer with 24 frames. <laughs> <laughs> what are you working on? Does your computer have pedals? No. Do you I have to know. kind of, I, 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 kind I of used to, to do this. doing a lower body workout, right? Now? I used to do this 20 <laughs> years ago, so I don't do it a lot today so i suppose i could probably do this today <laughs> okay. well i'm going to select frame uh 25 no 26 and frame 27 and i'm going to tween those as well okay i'll tell you what we'll get it to drop down a bit quicker so we won't do 24 or 23 here we'll do 11. arbitrary number i just happen to like the number 11. there we go now we can test it Okay, so down here we've got a little transport control. That's what the play controls are actually technically called. So if I go ahead and hit play. There's our bunny. Going ups and downsy, very good. Uh, we've got it set here to loop forever, yeah, which is handy. Okay, all the timing that uh, Melissa was talking about is at the bottom here, so you can slow an animation down slightly, right, by giving it slightly more time on screen. There are also other options like uh, disposal that you can use, which will uh, only remove, re it's pretty much like um, encoding video, right? It will just only do the diffs, the differences between uh, frames. That's about right, isn't it, Ari? Ari, that's, that's about right. Something like that, yep. Good, good, good. Uh, from there, typically you would then go to the file menu, you would go to the awkwardly named uh, export uh, and save for web legacy yeah despite the fact it's the only option you have for for exporting animated gifs really uh, slightly awkward to call it legacy 
you should maybe call it sometimes legacy, but of course that might not fit for internationalization, who knows? Right, then that would take you across to the Save for Web workspace, which it's doing just now. You can tell that it's worked because there's a timeline just here. Okay, I can then save that, determine a location for it. I'll just drop it onto uh, the desktop here and later on I'll stick it onto Giphy. Bunny hat, there we go. Doof like that you could even test it from here actually if you want to so uh, from the uh, save for web legacy dialogue and then we've got it if i just go ahead and get a browser window on here bringing in a browser like so okay i'm going to open uh, on the desktop that file and there it is now, in case you're wondering why it's gone all speckly at the back there, that's just because I used a, a different algorithm to interpret those smooth gradients. But you can do all sorts of different things to do that. Not bad, huh? Good fun thing to do uh, just there. Right, moving on into Illustrator very, very quickly. Uh, in the, have I really got just like one minute left? You're good. Keep going. Okay, fantastic. I did tell Mrs. Harmer that I wouldn't be in bed till three o'clock. So, <laughs> so, and she was very happy about that. So, uh, what was I going to do in Illustrator? Oh yeah, I was going to do a couple of things. Uh, Illustrator has a fab thing called Asset Export, right? I don't know how many of you use Illustrator or if you've used the Asset Export panel, right? But it's a way of avoiding things like save for web because you might have an artboard that has many pieces of artwork on it in fact i'm going to do this a couple of times so here okay i've got some artwork and this isn't mine this is from adobe stock this stuff and i'm just going to place it like so okay just in here and i'm not even unlinking it i'm letting it come in essentially as linked assets just there so you might have something like that and then you might go to the asset export panel Okay, and you might add things to that panel. So you might drop stuff in like so. Uh, shame it doesn't give you an option to name it just without me thinking about it, but anyway, there you are. Or you can drag stuff in, you can hold down the option key so it comes in as a single asset. Okay, or if it's made of multiple components, you can just drag it in and it will do all of the components. It's very cool. Then when you've got those things, you can highlight them and then you can go ahead and export them in a number of different ways. You can add different renditions here. You can see you've got different scaling options there. You've also got different formats that you might want to export them to. So you can create your own mixture for those things. That then makes the export operation pretty much one click. It will then just run through all of those things and do them for you. Whereas if you're still forced to use the old save for web stuff, which you would be if you're on a much earlier version of Illustrator, right? you'd have to be going back there every time to save those things. And if you were doing stuff for mobile, like if you're doing stuff for Android, you have to supply about seven different renditions, okay, of an asset, yeah? Because theirs goes between extra small and extra, extra, extra large in there pretty much like my t-shirts yeah covers that entire range depending on if i'm in germany or here right so that's the thing you can guess which is which right so that's what we've got in asset export the only thing with asset export is this right when you export it is as frugal as it possibly can be it's properly economical with the pixels right in that it, they go very very tight to the actual asset. So we'll try that out here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to target asset one here and I'm going to export this. Okay. And I'm going to drop it into the Denver UG group uh, just here. I'll create a new folder uh, called exports like so. Okay. And then we'll drop that in there and it tells me that it's successfully completed, which is good because then I can go ahead and get a new finder window open and drop into that and into exports and then hopefully I can preview it right now you should be able to see what I mean right the edges of that graphic are right the way to the edge of the file 
which might not be what you want, especially if you had some images that were lining up next to each other, they've got no breathing room around them at all, right? So there's no boundary. And Illustrator does not give you an option to include a boundary as far as I'm aware, at least I've never found one. Okay, so we'll do something about that in just a moment, but I want to take this, I, I am gonna fix that, but I also want to do something else because it's quite possible that the graphic on its own, okay, uh, isn't working out. It might be wanting to be placed on all different sorts of backgrounds. So it may need some sort of key line scheme around it. So I'm going to draw uh, just very quickly a different colored background just here like so. Okay, and I think I'll make that, uh, we'll go with that. That's uh, all my retinas, there we are. Okay, so we're gonna go with this and then I'm gonna bring in some of those assets. This time I'm going to option drag them uh, in because I do actually want them as actual artwork. So I'm just gonna go ahead and drop this one down here like so. Okay, and then option drag this one in. I'll just do a handful. Okay, and then option drag maybe this one in like so. And uh, this one of how not to DIY. Okay. So that one just there, good, okay? Now I need to add a key line to all of those things. And there are several different ways I could achieve that. But when I do this, if I have a job that has like several icons or elements that are going to need a key line around it, I would rather do it to a layer. So everything that goes to that layer, okay, gets treated the same way. Right, and that's what I'm going to do just here. So I'm going to go to the layer and I'm going to click on the layer target. That's this small circle just here. Once I've done that, Illustrator now knows that the object I am concerned with working with is a layer. So if I go ahead and open the appearance panel at the top, it's confirming to me, to me that I have the layer and it's telling me that there are contents on that layer. Okay, so that's all pretty straightforward. So I'm now gonna go ahead and add some stuff. Now, if you use Illustrator, I'm gonna give you an undocumented shortcut. I normally sing that, I normally say undocumented shortcut, like that. And today's no exception. All right, so now I've done that. The undocumented shortcut, in fact, I'm gonna give you two because I'm nice like that, or I try to be. The shortcut to add a new fill which you can see down at the bottom here has a little icon, add new fill, and there's one for add new stroke. To add a new fill is command slash or control slash if you be there on Windows, R, like so, okay? If you wanna add a new stroke, it's alt, sorry, option command slash or alt control slash to do that, okay? So just remember the control slash thing, command slash thing, and just think, I need a stroke, then just add the alt to it. Now at the moment it's filling that entire layer uh, just there, that's just fine. That's because I stupidly put the rectangle on the back of that layer. So I'm gonna rectify that uh, right now. Okay, so I'll fix that. And here's another learning thing for you. If you want to add a layer beneath the current layer, because new layers are normally added on top, hold down shift and tap D, which takes you into draw behind mode. Then if you do command L or control L, for a new layer, it's dropped down underneath the current layer. You can then do Shift D to return, you need to do it twice actually if you've got something selected, to return back to the normal method. And then with the proxy, I'm just gonna drag that down to the bottom and lock it and not be that stupid ever again, I beg your forgiveness. Right, so back to the appearance panel, or oh, I'll need to retarget the layer as well. Back to the appearance panel, we can now see that our new fill is working very, very well. However, it is on top of the contents. So I'm going to drag it down beneath the contents. Okay, now we can't see it, but that's not a big deal uh, just at the moment. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to target that so it's highlighted in the appearance panel. I'm then going to go to the effects, which you can access either at the bottom of this panel, okay, or over here in the properties panel, or in the window menu at the top there, sorry, in the effect menu at the top there, because remember Illustrator engineers are paid by the UI element, 
okay? So the more they add in, the more they're bringing home the dollars and making it rain. That's the way it works. So I'm gonna to go to effects and path and I'm going to choose offset path, okay? And I'm gonna offset these. I'm actually gonna go with uh, three millimeters, I think. Okay, like so. Now you can see these jaggy points here, right? That's because those corners aren't mitering properly. This has been drawn to look uh, isometric. And the way to resolve that most of the time, and in fact, the best fail safe is to switch that to rounded, which just makes everything nice and safe, like the scissors that I'm allowed to use. Okay, so nice and round on the end. So I'm gonna hit okay. Then with that highlighted, I'm going to click the plus at the bottom, which will duplicate the current effect. Okay, I'm then going to change that one to white like so, and I'm gonna click on offset path associated with that fill and drop that down to maybe, I'm gonna to go to 1.6554, yeah, just there because I like making up numbers. Okay, and hit okay. And you can see how that's working. So I've got a nice key line around that. And you know what? I'm actually going to duplicate it one more time. Okay, so I'm gonna click and duplicate it. So let's have a quick appraisal of what we've got here, okay? We've got a fill that is white, as we can see there around all of that. Underneath that, we've got a fill that is black at three millimeters like so. And underneath that, we've got an exact copy of that, black at three millimeters, okay, underneath. I'm gonna leave that at black. What I'm going to do is I'm first of all gonna to go to the offset path here and I'm going to add in another millimeter just there like so. OK, although it could be anything if I wanted to do it specifically in pixels. In fact, if I just go back to uh, three millimeters here. OK, like so I could uh, add plus two PX on the end there and it does that uh, calculation for me. We should never forget that we sit in front of a massive great calculator. OK, so it's just adding that extra two pixels around the edge. However, uh, I wanted to demonstrate that to you, but the, the whole millimeter thing is probably better. In fact, I'm gonna go two just there. Okay, so five millimeters in total. I'm then going to go to the opacity and I'm going to change the opacity to screen in which black is invisible. Black is a neutral in the screen blend mode. Okay, and white is a neutral in the multiply blend mode. Doesn't matter which one you use. However, that's not enough to achieve what I need to achieve. I'm going to go to the opacity menu, just here or the opacity option, and take that down to 0%. That forces Illustrator to draw that stroke and honor that effect, even if it's not doing anything to anything else. It's forcing it to do it, it's making it behave. Photoshop has a very, very similar mechanism to force it to do some things like that. Okay, so you're all familiar with what I've got there now? Anything that's on that layer, okay, will now have that effect applied to it. In fact, just to show you, if I go ahead and bring in uh, this ring master just here, okay, as pixels and drag that on, you can see that instantly, okay, it has that applied to it, okay? Much more sensible, especially if I was drawing things and dropping them in right, or even drawing them directly on there, although that can get a bit confusing uh, to be quite frank. Now, if I go back here to the export options, I'm just gonna drag this example in here. So I'm just gonna option drag that in, like so. The effects are honored when it gets inside there. Okay, asset four is just fine. So I'll target that, I'll export it to the same location just here. So that's being exported right now. We can then go and visit that location. Okay, so just to refresh your memory, there's asset four tight to the edges, oh, sorry, asset one, tight to the edges. Here's asset four. You can see it's got the key line effects that I added to it against the background, but also it's got that extra millimeter space around it on the edges. You can see that the shoulder there, okay, and just down to the rear of the hips there and the feet and indeed the hat have got that extra gap. I'll just flick up to the one above it again. So that's what it was before tight to the edges, that's what it is there with that extra effect added because it forces it to draw it uh, when it renders the ping. So that's a kind of a useful thing to have. Okay, we are 
uh, running out of time, however. So what I thought I'd just show you, uh, and I think I'll have to show you this as an example. I thought if I run out of time, because I do talk quite quickly, and what, but I also waffle on, uh, I thought I'd show you a neat trick with just this piece of type just here. But instead, I'll show you what I actually did with it. So if I go to this document just here, okay, what I'm gonna do is show you the only real piece of content that is on here. So command Y, control Y to go into outline mode. You can see it's exactly the same thing. It's just that piece of text, okay? Everything else that's on there is an effect. Dun, 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 waffle isn't like a waffle iron, no. To waffle is just to like go chat, 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 yeah. Whenever the prime minister's on telly, it's good that bloke waffles on, right? <laughs> so there you are. Okay, so you can see all of this here. Now, let, let me give you an idea of how this has been built because it is quite a complex build. It's actually quite a long build, uh, this one. So if I select the piece of type just here, you can see it's in a group hierarchy that has lots of effects applied to it. If I start to turn things off, so the chip that's in the top right-hand corner there, okay, there's some strokes on top of that, and then there's a fill, you'll start to see things disappearing. Then there's another stroke just there, then there's another stroke underneath that, then there's another fill underneath that, then there's another fill underneath that, okay? And that has various effects on it as well, okay? So just drop shadow. Uh, then there is, oh, that's the, um, for the background just there, there's sort of a very, very faint gradient going around and right at the bottom underneath the contents. So underneath this group here, okay, there's that pattern, okay, in a couple of places just there. Okay, then there's a card at the back, which is the thing that adds the flavor to it. Because otherwise, if you just show the whole thing with the whole single suit on, it's fairly unremarkable from an appearance point of view. But if you do something that is not quite the same at the back, it confuses people and they think there's got to be at least two objects in there uh, to draw that. But you can see there actually isn't. I'll reveal the rest to you and then uh, we'll wrap up if that's OK uh, with you. Much as I'd, I think I could probably stay here all night. Um, I might get into trouble, though, and I would be useless at work tomorrow. So let's not probably do that. So I'll turn these back on. OK, so there's all of that stuff just there. So it's just a mixture of different fills changed to rectangles or changed to other things and pattern fills on there are doing a lot of the work as well. I'm going to double click on this group. So it's this single piece of type that has been grouped. Now, if I double click on that, OK, I'm now into the group. It's a single object group. But when I click on it, you can see it's got type on it. OK, and then going from the bottom, just here, well, actually, I'll go from the top with the stroke that's on there. I'll turn that off and I'll come down here. I'll turn off the fill. So can you see what's happened there? OK, so watch again. You'll see all of the things that give the illusion that it's a suite of cards just there. And uh, sorry, a suit of cards. I'll tell you how it's done. It's done with a pattern. So what I did was when I designed it, I made a pattern that just had these two things in and was separated by enough distance to clear the card. I designed the pattern tile to be a size that went exactly inside those cards. So it was all calculated uh, to work, okay? Then underneath that, there is the actual fill of the cards itself. This is where it gets a bit crazy because there's transforms on here. So if I turn those off, it comes down to this. Now you're still seeing the stuff from the group above, but that in itself is a pattern also. But when you add all of these different things together, because it's hot, kind of hard to unravel that part just there, that's what you get. Which is mad, isn't it, right? <laughs> Absolutely mad. Just very, 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 very quickly. Yes, it was mad. It's probably faster to do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> Go out and draw them. That's insane. Yes. <laughs> you know, it well, it is and it isn't. You know, the thing is, it does 
that's more of an ex it's more of a practice exercise that than it is a real deployment of it because by doing right. things like that and seeing how far you can push it you start to think about things that you potentially could draw programmatically yeah and if you could draw something by doing something as small as an anchor point yeah all right that would work so i'll do that if i just go here and get my uh get my regular pen tool and click so this single anchor point i'm going to hit escape so I'm no longer drawing, but the anchor point is there. I'll go to the appearance panel. So there's that anchor point. It thinks it's got a stroke on it. It doesn't need it, yeah, because it doesn't have any definition at all. Has got a fill, yeah. I'll change that fill to orange. Now we can't see it because you're looking at an infinites infinitesimally small thing, yeah, that has no real dimension. It has magnitude and direction and all of that stuff. Interestingly enough, just so you know, the direction is directly east of where it is. The zero point for vectors in Illustrator is to the um, is to the immediate right of the vector, yeah, or you know, eastward as it would be on a map. So I've got that fill targeted here on that anchor point. I'm then going to go to the effects here, convert to shape, convert to a rounded rectangle. You can see immediately I start to get an effect there. I'm going to set that to absolute. And then I'd give it some dimensions. Now I worked out what the dimensions would be for the card, but arguably here, what I'm going to say is I'm going to say 20, okay, in the width, okay, and then I'll say 30 in the height, just there. Oh, I'm going to go bigger. Go bigger tone. All right, I'll go bigger. <laughs> I'm going to go 200 in the width because I'm on a, a 1080p document and 300 in the height. Then I'm going to add in some corner radius there like so. Okay, so I've got that. I've got a shape there that you can clearly see. All right, I'm then going to transform that. So effects, distort and transform, transform. Okay, I'm going to rock that around slightly. I'm going to rotate it. Okay, like so. Do you know what? I think I do actually need a stroke on that. So I'm going to get the stroke and draw that. Then I'm going to hold down the option key and drag rounded rectangle onto that. And also the transform as well. So I've copied those two things across. Let's make that slightly stronger. I'm thinking more about your viewing comfort than I am actually doing the thing here. Now, this is the point at which I will probably group that single anchor point. So command G, control G to group the anchor point because then I can add pile more effects on top of it. So if I went ahead now and went to sort and transform, transform, okay, and said, make me nine copies of that and rotate them around by this much and then make the transformation point the bottom right hand corner like that, or the bottom left-hand corner, like that, or wherever you want to make the transformation point, entirely up to you, it's your gig. But you can see how easy it is to do that. And if I think, you know what, they could fade off into the distance, I make them each one 10% smaller than the last one. And that's just with this, and you can go further and further and further, but that's just with one anchor point. And that really is it from me. I've got nine minutes to get into the bedtimes. I'm halfway in my pajamas. Right. <laughs>